Jeremy, welcome to the show, man. Great to visit with you. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. I'm excited. Yeah, my pleasure. So uh, where are you joining us from? I'm joining from uh, Calgary, Alberta. Right in Canada, yeah. So you're a big hockey fan? No, not so much. Watch a little bit, mostly the playoffs. And... Yeah, it sounds about like me. <laughs> <laughs> the Stars are in first place, though. I do know that. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, so are you a uh, a lifelong outdoorsman? Yeah, a lifelong. Uh, ever since I was a little kid, uh, you know, my... Um, I ran around in the bush with my dad. We did a lot of hunting and fishing, lots of camping, hiking all over the place, um, looking for sheep. You know, when I was very little, I was out with my dad, you know, um, either on his back or trying to keep up to him going up into the, the back of the mountains in uh, Kanaskis country there and looking for sheep, chasing gross and just lots of little fun. Yeah. So what is your, what is your favorite thing to hunt? Hmm. Uh, I'm going to say it's sheep right now. Uh, I haven't harvested one harvested one yet, uh, bighorn, but uh, keep trying. It just, I mean, I, I like to hunt everything. Uh-huh. I'm mostly a bow hunter, so, and hunting anything is a challenge with a bow, and I, I just enjoy getting out there and uh, being in the wilderness, fresh air. And... Oh, yeah. Yeah, so what is that like for an Alberta resident as far as sheep hunting is concerned? You know, for me, it's like, if I don't draw somewhere, which is has to be either totally random or I have to build enough preference point, you know, preference points in some Western state, by the time I get enough points, I'll be probably too old to even go on the hunt. Uh, so that leaves those options or, you know, paying $50,000 for one. What is it like for Alber- Albertans? In Alberta, as a resident, you could buy a tag over the counter every year and you've got a variety of zones you can hunt in. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of the zones where... There's, uh, I guess, a lot more known, like uh, Cadman Mines, and uh, there's a few other little zones that it take you a lifetime to get drawn in. Uh, but, yeah, every year you can buy a tag over the counter. If you harvest a ram that year, you can't buy a tag until the uh, until year, I think it's two years after you harvest a ram. So pretty much buy a tag, go run around, and try to get one. Huh. And you, But you've yet to kill one. I have yet to. Yep. Um, there's about, you know, two to 3% chance of harvesting a legal ram. Uh, in Alberta, depending on the zone, you got to shoot a four fist curl or a full curl ram. Uh-huh. And so over the years, I hunted mostly in a, in a four fist curl zone, but it's really hard to judge a ram at, you know, half mile, 500 yards, trying to make sure he's legal. I never pulled the trigger on one. I've came close. I passed up some rams that I know now were legal but it's just, it's really tough to make that call. Is it legal, not legal? And that's what I struggle oh, yeah. with. Yeah. Well, you know, there's, there's certainly something to that as far as the uh, level of expertise concerned to, to be able to tell through a spotting scope at a thousand yards away. Yeah. That's a legal ram or even further, you know, yep. and then do you, do you want to waste the day and all that energy trying to get to it, you know, and then it not end up being legal. So that, that's the tough call. Me, I just, I would go, I'd see a ram where it looks like a ram and I'd hike all the way over there, spend the day or a day and a half, get over to that ridge and get over there. I'm like, oh, no, not even close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. So it's the summer of 2017 when you were mauled by a grizzly in the Alberta Rockies. And so were you sheep hunting then? Yes, it was. It was the uh, day before sheep season. My, uh, that, that summer, I spent the whole the whole summer, every weekend going out. I uh, found a band of rams, and I was keeping track of them from, I guess, you know, June all the way till late August when this took place on August 24th. Uh, my plan was to go out there the day before sheep season, hike out, find my ram, set up camp, wait till the following morning, and then harvest them, pack up, and hike out. Uh, it was my 40 weekend. I was pretty mm-hmm. excited. And what caliber do you take sheep hunting? I... I normally do with my bow, but I have a 300 wind mag. I brought uh, this time here was I brought my uh, rifle just to make it quick and yeah. in and out. And so what happened on that day? Uh, I think I read that you saw a little brown fur ball run by and you immediately knew, uh oh, there's going to be a bigger <laughs> one behind it. Yeah. So that morning I got out there uh, about 2.30 a.m. in the morning 
left my truck, hopped on my bicycle, and I rode back in, uh, back into the mountains, into the far back uh, drainages. I got to the very end. There's one last steep drainage before you get into the back bowl. I was coming up that, slowly making my way up with my bicycle and my gear, and I just kind of started breaking all the tree line. Uh, it was about 9 a.m., and I saw some sheep on the on the back bowl. I was sitting there watching them. Go, oh, okay, wicked. There's some sheep. So I'm getting excited. And I'd walk about ten feet, sneaking through, stop, watch for about ten minutes, and then move a little bit forward more and more. Just watch them. Watch was gonna basically keep following until they bedded down, and then set up camp. Uh, so I got to a spot, and I started to see some rams. Uh, so I took off my backpack and leaned it against my bicycle. I had my elbows on the handlebars just to steady myself, sitting there glass and watching watching the rams. Then I got up and just kind of stretched, moved around. When I was doing that, I noticed a little brown thing run in front of me, you know, probably about 10 feet away. Oh. I knew I knew right away what it was. I, I just got this feeling of being like fucked, like, uh oh, there's there's the baby. Where's mama? <laughs> <laughs> And it, it's the strangest feel like you're sitting there until still this day you just get that like you just the cold air kind of just swoops across your body you get the shivers and you're like oh shit so <laughs> uh my first instinct was to grab my bear spray and and stupid me i that morning i threw in the bottom in my backpack because it was like what's the chance of me seeing a bear and so i'm um, leaning over trying to get my bear spray on my backpack uh, i was leaning against my bicycle as I was leaning over to grab it, I heard a branch break over my right shoulder. And as I looked, there was Mama. She's already in a full charge. She was less than an arm's reach away. Her uh, right paw was stretched out. I could see her claws. Uh, the left side, I could see the whites of her eyes. Her mouth slightly open. I mean, she was in, she was in a full charge. Oh. I uh, <laughs> just uh, grabbed a, my bicycle and just leaned to the side. And I dropped my bicycle right in front of her. Her uh, head went through the frame of the bicycle and she stopped and turned and looked at me and picked and had the bike around her neck and she shook it off and came, was kind of turning towards me. Well, she's pretty close. I smashed her in the face of my backpack as hard as I could and she was chomping at it. And then I, it was uh, a Badlands ox pack, so it was the metal frame on the side. So I had that and I started smashing her in the head and hitting her in the face with it. She managed to get a hold of my right hand, crush against the pack, and that hurt a little bit. She let go, and I kept pushing her back. Uh, she kind of stopped, turned, and started walking away. And I was like, oh, okay. And so, <laughs> Like, my hand hurts, but that wasn't so bad. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, okay, well, this is good. <laughs> so she's walking away, and I'm trying to get my bear spray on my backpack because my gun was strapped to the pack, and, you know, my ammo was inside. It. And so I'm trying to pull my bear spray out or something, and I remember looking up, she had spun, she's about 30 feet away. She had spun right around and she came charging in. And this is what I call the beginning of round two. Oh gosh. Wow. So when, when she turned around, she came charging in. I was like, oh crap. So I, my back, I had my backpack and I just threw it right at her. And, uh, I decided to run up the mountainside. Um, I was going to run up the hill. It was a pretty steep hill and figured if I get, run up the hill and run past a tree. I could jump off the hill into the tree to get some extra, extra, you know, ground length. I thought that was a great idea. Well, <laughs> she come running behind me and I remember running, I get to get to a tree, jump into it. And I can hear her, this. <laughs> and you can just hear her paws hitting the ground, her body. Like she was coming in flying. So I was about five, six feet off the ground. My right leg was dangling low. I was trying to pull it up as I was doing that. Uh, she stood on her hind legs and reached up with both paws, wrapped them around my right leg and pulled it to her mouth. And I remember just seeing her lunge up. And as she lunged up, uh, she grabbed me right behind the knee and her teeth wrapped around my knee there. And I just remember looking down going, this is going to hurt. Mm. So she uh, ripped me right out of a tree, just one little jerk. And I hit the ground pretty hard. I was in a spruce tree, and so my first instinct, I was just going to crawl underneath the spruce tree and wrap myself around it, and hopefully the spruce brow, she'll have trouble digging at me and maybe protect me a little bit. So she was clawing at it, and it was working. Um, she seemed to get angrier, a little more violent. She reached in with her mouth and grabbed me on the right side, or left side, and the love handles just above the, I guess, just below the ribs, above the hips there, and she uh -huh. grabbed me, picked me up, and threw me about six feet. 
uh, I hit the ground pretty dazed and I was laying on my right side and trying to curl up in a ball as I'm doing that. She was, she pounced on me. Like it was half a second. I literally couldn't, I hit the ground, you know, go to take a breath. And then she was on me. Um, the oh. first, the first thing she did was bite me in the face and, uh, her, uh, we'll just kind of demonstrate here. Her, oh, uh, she's got a grizzly skull here. <laughs> actually, this is a black bear. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, just, uh, anyways, her, uh, top two canine teeth caught me on either side of the left eye. And when she bit oh. down, she crushed everything below my left eye. Well, uh, my nose, corner of my nose, where the tear ducts are and crushed everything down all the way down to my cheek, down to my jaw. And that was the, uh, her first bite. And, and I'm laying there and that really hurt. And I was sitting there thinking, well, this playing dead sucks, especially when you're getting chewed on. Yeah. Oh, so, all right. So playing dead I and mean, they always say, and, and I don't know if this is true or not, but you always hear, you know, play dead with a grizzly fight a black bear off because black bear is trying to eat you or a grizzly. It's like this, a predatory, uh, protecting the young type or you're, you're in their, uh, territory. So I don't know. It sounds like, uh, it sounds like it didn't matter what you did <laughs> in this situation. Well, it, it depends on, it depends on the attack. Like even with a black bear. Uh, or or grizzly uh it depends on if it's a defense attack or if it's a predatory attack mm -hmm. if it's a predatory attack either black bear or grizzly fight for your life because they're trying to eat you mm -hmm. if it's a defense attack you're you're better off to play dead because the more you fight back the more they're going to keep going because all they're trying to do is neutralize the threat mm -hmm. and then they'll take off so in this instance because of the cub i was between the mom and her cub this was a full defense attack well you know i'm laying there she took that big bite out of me and i'm thinking like this sucks right like I, so i rolled over started punching her in the nose poking her eyeballs grabbing her ear just trying to you know show my fingers in her nose just to get her to stop biting me with my right hand and uh she came down to bite me a second time in the face and it just was like a I don't know, like a ah uh, sweet moment, I call it. Um, the way her mouth was coming down, it just was in a perfect line with my left hand. And I punched my left hand into her mouth. And I just remember my hand sliding down her tongue. And you can feel all the little bumps. And the beginning is kind of a little bit rough. And it gets a little soft. And it feels like leather. And you can feel all the little scars in the ridge of the tongue. And I shoved my index finger, middle finger down her throat and wrapped my thumb in pinky and ring finger around her tongue and i was holding on she was uh started to gag and and i remember looking at my arm and about you know two-thirds of my forearm was uh in her mouth and i was just holding on uh she was choking and almost trying to squeal like a pig uh -huh. her uh back paws were digging into the right side of my stomach you know, that was hurting. So I was trying to push them off as I was pushing her hind end. Uh, my hand slipped and I hit the belly and I could tell it was the belly softer, softer hair, less hair. I reached up and grabbed what I thought was balls at the time, but it was just some really loose skin pretty high up. I grabbed it and twisted and pulled. And when I did that, she uh, gasped, took a large gasp and she let out a squeal like a pig, like a really deep, deep squeal. Oh. And I'm holding on and she's squealing and she's, you know, kind of gagging and making a lot of sound, really, really flopping around. I figured she got the point and I let go. And she ran back the way she came, just defecating across the mountainside, squealing like a pig, real deep, deep squeal. So she runs off. I started up right away and dusted myself off. I'm like, well, that sucked. <laughs> I got, uh, I got back to my pack and. Oh, and uh, first thing I did was I took out my phone and I took a selfie of myself to see what I, what I look like. And uh, I was like, well, that's not so bad. Um, but in this picture, you can see, that, you know, a large majority of my face has been removed. Um, I yeah. could send you, I'll send you the picture there. And Yeah, y'all can see that on my, I'll post it on my Instagram and the, and the website as well. So it, it's quite gruesome. Uh, but I was sitting there looking at it thinking, well, you know, it's not that bad. This is where I think a little bit of shock was kicking in. And I was thinking, well, I can either go hunt that bear or I can go and go get that cheap, you know, and then get out of here. 
<laughs> so I'm sitting there, you know, I'm at my pack, I'm leaning against this old stump, and I was pretty, I was pretty mad. I'm like, well, now I gotta go home. And I spent all summer in here, and my Rams over there, and like I just I I was so frustrated. And so I'm sitting there and I got my gun against my left shoulder and I'm loading up my clip. And uh as I'm loading up my clip, I heard the sound of ice breaking and my arms dropped just kind of dropped it was almost like i was paralyzed uh, she had come back and grabbed me by the back of the skull and she drug me back into the bush when she when she grabbed me i was pretty much lifeless couldn't really move i just seen her paws on the other side of me digging into the ground and she's just pulling backwards you can hear her huffing like whoo, whoo, as she's pulling me back in uh, I don't know, you know, how far she drug me in, but it was, seems like it seemed like a little ways. So how how much time it elapsed from when she ran ran off and then came back? This is probably you know f- uh, seven to ten minutes ish. Huh. So I mean, I felt it, like this, a, that's that's so weird. Like you would have thought she had found her cub, and that was that. Uh, yeah. What uh, what happened was where I was. There was a cliff in front of me. And then the drainage I walked up was pretty steep. And then they got the hard rock behind me. So when she ran back, she ran back the way her, the way she came. But the cub ran down the drainage and down into the bottom where there was a creek. And so I think she was trying to get back to her cub. And I was in the way again. Uh, uh-huh. Okay. So, so she's dragging you back into the brush. Dragging me back in the brush. Uh, we came to a stop and I was sitting on my butt, leaning against I assume was her front legs. Uh, she reached over with her one claw on, caught me on the right side of the face on the corner of my mouth and nose with her claw. And she peeled all the skin and everything off of my head on the right side from basically center of my nose, all the way up my right, my right ear, all the skin off my head. I noticed that and, the right side of your hair is not, doesn't grow as well as the left side. Yeah, I missed that piece in the bush. <laughs> she may have eaten that. <laughs> so she she peeled all the all the skin off uh, my right ear, and she was chewing on the top left corner of my head, um, left side all the way down to my collarbone. She was chewing on my neck and just chewing away like a dog bone. I just remember hearing her teeth just crunching away, and just ripping and tearing. And you don't really have a way to defend yourself because she's behind you right now. She's behind me. And it was almost like I was paralyzed. Like I couldn't move. It just, I felt totally helpless. I just was like a doll laying there. She's ripping and tearing. Uh. Um, she moved or shifted and I fell onto the ground. I hit the ground and that's when I can start really feeling things. Uh, I couldn't see at this point because my left eye was hanging out of the socket, hanging down. My right eye had been... Uh, bashed into my skull and facing up like i didn't i couldn't feel it i couldn't find it like it wasn't there uh i knew something was above me i could feel the hair you know i could kind of tell there was something dark so i reached up with my ha- both hands and i felt the same spot that i thought was balls you know uh, a little soft squishy skin so i grabbed that twisted and pulled both hands i then wrapped my legs around her neck and kind of locked them in like a kind of like a UFC fighter, you know, just lock my legs in. Mm-hmm. And, and I was holding on for dear life, and whatever I had, I was trying to rip off. As I was pulling on it, she started to buck like a bronco and and squeal like a pig. She's flopping around, rolling around on the mountainside, making all kinds of horrible noises. And then I let go, and she went running, screaming down the mountainside. Um, after that, I, I couldn't stand. I couldn't see. I... Like there was, there's pieces just hanging everywhere. I crawled down the mountain, the hillside. I got to the trail and I managed to find my pack and gear. As, uh, when I found that, I was uh, looking for the gun, feeling around and I found the gun right away. I grabbed some shells and I tried to put them down into the chamber. Um, I, this time I had, it was the Tika T3 light. And so you need the clip. I mean, you can put them down the uh, shell down into the chamber, but mm-hmm. I couldn't. My fingers were all going different ways, and I couldn't see. And I struggled to get it in, so I started to panic. I was feeling around for the clip on the hillside, and the first thing I found was my mustache and goatee. And then I found a chunk of my face, and then I found one of my ears. Oh, uh, and then 
then i found the clip and you're and like that was I, a good looking goatee i just found <laughs> uh i threw the i threw the uh clip into the gun and the first dark thing beside me got three rounds i just shot three rounds and the closest dark thing reloaded it fired three rounds and the next dark thing and i'm just sitting there like what do you do uh -huh. um i had all these pieces in my face in my hand and I, I was just sitting there and um i knew at that point that i wasn't going to make it that this was this was pretty much the end for me so that I, was one of my questions is what point or if did you ever feel like you were going to die I, I the whole time i never thought i was ever going to make it hmm. uh, i knew i was going to die it was just a matter of when and where mm -hmm. and so i'm sitting there in the hillside kind of debating you know like what do you do do you do you end it yourself do you let it just happen um wow that crossed your mind too just to put yourself out of your own misery it, yes it did and uh this is still a decision that haunts me today is uh you know i grabbed my phone and and tried to text my wife and let her know that uh you know basically my final goodbyes to her and i, uh -huh. I had no service and i knew she would never get the text messages until they found the body but i uh, sent her uh, a goodbye message letting know i love her and to take care of her daughter and that and uh i made the decision to uh to end it myself so i uh, grabbed my rifle and loaded it loaded it up and uh, put the gun against the ground and put the barrel underneath my chin and you know i thinking about my family and like this is this is it so i pulled the trigger and the gun clicked i thought it was weird i just leaned it to the side and re uh Read, uh, opened the bolt and closed it again. And I pulled the trigger. Well, this time the gun went off just inches from my head, and uh, that freaked me out. And I was like, sitting thinking, like, what am I doing? Um, uh -huh. I they're never going to find me where I was. Uh, my wife would never know what happened. I was so far back in the bush that uh, I don't usually see people out there. The outfitters that hunt in the area never go that far back, you normally. And I wasn't really on a beaten trail. I was on a game trail. And I was just thinking like, you know, no one's going to find me here. I owed it to my wife and daughter to at least try, try to make it somewhere where someone's going to find the body. That way their my wife would have some closure. Mm -hmm. So I opened my pack and looking for something to put my pieces of my face in. And, uh, you know, I had a little first aid kit. There was nothing in there. There's nothing in my pack that would work. And, I grabbed, uh, I had a long sleeve sweatshirt. So I put the shirt on upside down with the body of the shirt open up to the top. And I took the, uh, the pieces of my face and just layered them in there on top of my skull. And I tried to put like blood to blood down. I don't know why I, uh, folded the shirt over the back of my head and then I tied a knot underneath my chin. Cause at this point my chin was hanging down left side of my chin was all it was all open hanging down and flopping so i tied the knot underneath really tight to help hold my chin up and then tied two knots in the back of my head just to keep my help keep my head straight uh the first hundred feet of the trail went down down the edge of a drainage and it's you know three four hundred yards or three, sorry three four hundred feet down to the bottom of the drainage and um i mean i couldn't even stand i couldn't even i couldn't even walk every time i stand up i'd fall right over again uh all the ligaments in my right leg were severed at the knee and it took a while for me to be able to get on my feet once i did i'd shuffle my right leg forward and take a step with my left and just keep kind how of shuffling how much blood are you losing at this point i mean was that ever a thought like i'm gonna bleed out like obviously you've suffered all these traumatic injuries all over your body but is there anything that's just like hemorrhaging blood to where you're like i gotta get a tourniquet on this or anything like that my head was my hands uh my my left side everywhere was bleeding i i knew i wasn't i knew i was gonna die i knew i just wanted to make it far enough down the trail that somebody would be likely to find me mm -hmm. um i tried to close up what i could in my head i mean i didn't have really much other than you know some clothes and a small first aid kit when i started to walk down that drainage i got i don't know maybe 100 feet down and I lost my footing and I tumbled all the way down the edge of the drainage down into some large boulders down by a creek in the bottom. 
uh, I tumbled head over heels and when I hit the rocks in the bottom, I was in a lot of pain. I was pretty mangled up and I given up. I was like, this is it. This is, this is it. I could hardly move. I'm in unsurmountable amount of pain. Um, I, I'm just laying in the rocks and I pulled my phone out to uh, play some music uh, just so I can relax and, you know, fall asleep, and let things happen. And I pulled it out. I go to play the, the last song that I played for my daughter the night before was actually on my phone. And when I went to go play it, it was, uh, the song was baby shark. Mm. <laughs> we all, all the parents know that one. <laughs> yeah. And, but you know, my daughter was uh, eight months old at the time and the night before I played that while putting it in her sleep and it was on, and it was on repeat. So I'm, I'm laying in the rocks and thinking about her and the song going on and, you know, and thinking about never going to see my wife and, my wife and daughter never going to see her grow up graduate high school never going to be able to walk down the aisle it was pretty rough and i was never gonna see my wife again uh we, we met in high school and she was my first true love and i was never going to see her again so yeah. laying there listening to baby shark after after it played on a couple of times i you know i decided i know i owe it to him to at least crawl up to the other side of this drainage get to that get to that trail at least somebody will find me there um so, you know, I reached, just, I reached out for the next Colson's rock to pull myself up and just, and just reach for the next rock. And I'm going to make it to that little stump or that little bush. I was just setting these little mini goals. Like I'm going to make it to there. And as I reached that, okay, well, I got enough strength. I can make it to the next one. And I remember crawling up the, that side of that drainage. That was a very painful yet. Um, I just wanted to make it somewhere where they're going to find me. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, I got up, I got up the, got up to the trail and I managed to get to some bushes and pull myself up so I could stand. And I was just focused on, you know, make it to that tree. And I just slowly made my way down the trail and, you know, I ended up making it to the next drainage, which is just as bad as the first one, but I was lucky enough and didn't fall way down to the bottom, only fell part way down and crawl across that. And I got to the main trail and I was like, feeling pretty good because you just accomplished all this little stuff. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to make it to the, now I'm on the main trail. I'm going to make it to where the trail splits. There's more people that go there. And I just, all the whole way, I was just thinking about my family. Just, can I make it to the next spot, the next spot? And how are you able to see anything at this point? I, I wasn't really. Uh, everything was all blurry. I could see about three feet in front of me. Uh, in order to look forward, I either had to pick up my left eye and hold it up or tilt my head way back so I can see. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, I, well, I remember this trail quite well, very well. I mean, I was spent 17 years hiking back in there in the dark and everything, so I, I know my way around. I, um, on that morning coming in, I passed some cowboys who were sitting on the edge of the trail about, I'd say, about three, maybe four kilometers from where I was in the morning. I rode past them on my bicycle and they were sitting there having their morning coffee. And one guy had a, like a big Lanny McDonald mustache. And I just remember him sitting there looking at me and the other guy like, Oh, who's this crazy kid on a bicycle going by? <laughs> uh, they were kind of at the spot where the trail splits. And I figure, you know, it's still pretty early in the morning or, you know, well, probably closer to 11 o'clock at this point. Uh, I figured they might be in camp still. Mm -hmm. So, I got down to where their camp was and um, they weren't there. There was no camp there. They had packed up and I, I was losing hope again. It was like, this is, it was devastating. They're not there. There's no one here to help me. And um, this is, you know, I, I'm still thinking I'm going to die. Just, I don't know where. Well, I uh, did read a, I read a report uh, from 20, from 2000 to 2015, there were roughly 183 grizzly attacks in North America, with 15% uh, of those ending up fatal. So, you know, you're thinking about, you're, you're, you think you're going to be one of those statistics, but yet you're, you're climbing and clawing your way back, giving yourself hope. Um, and then you get, and then you think you've gotten to a point where these cowboys are going to help me out. And then it's back to despair again. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was hard. Uh, continue on down the trail and uh, about halfway out, there's an out, there's another outfitter camp 
and the guys that they were there, you know, they're there every year. And I passed the tent in the morning, but didn't see anybody, but they were always there this weekend. I, so I passed where the Cowboys were in the morning. The trail kind of goes out to a Creek and the Creek is all blown out. Uh, there was a pretty big flood the year before, a couple of years before, and the Creek's all braided and there's no more trail. You just have to meander your way down the Creek to kind of find your way. And of course there's all the deadfall and all the, rubble from when the creek flooded so trying to crawl through that um i just you know you get up to a log or a piece of deadfall and you're like do i do i go around it do i crawl underneath it do i go over top of it dude and i hate if- doing that just when i'm elk hunting and i'm perfectly you know <laughs> have all my faculties and my eye isn't hanging out of my eye socket and my face isn't ripped off and my knee isn't you know all the ligament severed deadfall suck regardless and now you're having to deal with this crap in the state that you're in i i don't even can't even imagine it, it, it sucked like you're walking through the river rock and and you get to like if you can see the tree laying there and you don't know do you go towards the trunk or do you go towards the tip you try to walk over climb over you know if you go towards the trunk you get the big root ball and then usually everything else tangled up in there and it just mm-hmm. like it was so frustrating and just tiring exhausting I managed to make it through that, I guess, kind of like a minefield of, of deadfall. And I got to the outfitters tent that, you know, I know the guys are very well They're there every year. I get up to their camp and they have electric fence around there. So I open up the fence and got in and when I was walking in, I, it was empty. Uh, there was no horses there. And there's usually the uh, camp cook or somebody's usually in the camp all the time so i got to the first tent opened it up nobody there i went to the second tent opened it up nobody there and i'm like what do you do uh i went back to the first tent and figured oh, well they got to have a radio or a sat phone in here uh, i mean they always have it's probably in here somewhere I had a big white cabinet on the corner of the tent uh like a four foot by you know 18 inch cabinet uh and it had a fancy gate lock on it and I couldn't open it. And so I just grabbed the corner of it and knocked it over onto the ground and it broke open. Well, it was full of canned food and canned food roll across the floor. And there was this little black case. Uh, it looked like a, a cell phone case, from like the old school mic phones that you had. Mm-hmm. With the, uh, you know, I found that I was excited. I'm like, oh, so I opened it up. It was just like a Leatherman uh, <laughs> knife. <laughs> <laughs> and and i was sitting there i'm just devastated and, I, and at this point in time i'm starving i'm so tired i'm so exhausted uh amongst the cans on the ground there was one that was like a triangle shape and i knew what it was it was like the the cans of spam or ham the uh, soft ham mm-hmm. and, and uh, i was so hungry i'm like i want to eat that because i know what it is and um they got the little tea thing that you put in the can and you got to twist it to get the top off well, I, my fingers and that were in no shape. So I grabbed another can and started bashing it over and I managed to get a corner of it open. It was taking out this ham and sticking the corner of my mouth. And it was so good. I remember the taste of that. Oh, man. <laughs> so uh, get, it's like an advertisement for spam here. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was so good. <laughs> uh, I grabbed it. I was sitting there at, at the picnic table inside this tent with this, this ham. And I'm, uh, I'm bleeding all over the place. It's just dripping on the table and it's driving me in nuts. Like you just trip and try to clean it up and it just keeps coming. And I had a roll of uh, bounty sheets and toilet paper was sitting on the center of the, of the table. So I grabbed that and I tried folding up my skin on my jaw on the one side and started wrapping my face in these bounty sheets. And, and when I was doing that, my jaw kind of clicked. I think it was dislocated at the time. And when I was moving it around, it clicked back in and I could feel a lot of pressure relief from my face. Well, I wrapped these uh, bounty sheets and toilet paper around my face to help stop the bleeding. And I found they had a roll of like athletics tape, but it was a vet wrap for horses. So I took that and I wrapped that around to hold the toilet paper and help hold my pieces, the, the you know, what was hanging in my face kind of in place and taped up my hands, try to cover the holes on them. And, uh, and I'm sitting there and, you know, just exhausted. Uh, I, uh, just figured this would probably be the best place to be. Cause someone's going to find me here right away, you know, that night or whatnot. So I, 
rolled out a sleeping bag on the floor and I got over to the stove and I opened it up to make a fire because it was cold and just, you know, we had to give up. Uh, the outfitter was really good that they had like fire starters in there and everything's all made for the fire. And I was sitting there and I was trying to figure out like, what do I do? And, and uh, before I laid down, I, uh, they had some, I found some sheets of paper and a marker and I wrote a little note to the outfitter for letting them know who I was and then I got attacked by a bear and the back of the note, it was to my, it was for my wife just to let her know that I tried and I left that on the table and I, uh, mm. you know, I figured the heck I'm just going to, I'm just going to go for it. I'm still another five or so miles from my truck. I'm just going to try to make it. Maybe the outfitter is walking back in, you know, maybe they went out to go get some more gear and, uh, they had some juice boxes there, so I grabbed the last little touch of pack of juice boxes, started squirting them in my mouth, and decided I'm going to hike out. Uh, open up the tent. I had three rounds left for my rifle. I, I fired those off in the air, put the gun in the middle of the tent, stuck the note to it, and then uh, closed up the tent and made my way uh, towards the truck. I, I I still, at this point in time, I was thinking that, you know, I'm just still not going to make it. I mean, I mean yeah. Um, from this part of the trail on it's fairly flat you cross the creek a couple more times and you get to a base of this big hill then you got to climb up and over and it's quite a steep hill i got to the base of the hill and i'm thinking well i could follow the creek down another couple miles and cut up to the road and then hike back down the road to my truck but if i did that no one's going to find me uh so i better off just go hike up this massive hill and get over the other side and then down to my truck and uh I just remember watching my feet and just shuffling my feet up this hill. I got about three quarters of the way up, almost to the top of the hill. There's these two boulders. They're about two box size. They're in the middle of the trail. And for 17 years, I was too lazy to move them out of the way of the trail. Every time I ride my bike down, you'd hit them and you almost fall over. And you hated those <laughs> rocks. I remember just seeing the, seeing that rock or both those rocks there. And I was so happy because I knew when I saw those rocks, I was going to make it to the truck. And I had one juice box up, so I sucked that back and I set it on top of the rock and I kissed the rock and <laughs> I knew I was going to make it to my truck. It was, you know, less than a mile away at that point. I got to the top of the hill, right around down the other side of the hill and uh, about 10 feet from where my truck is parked, there was a gate. There, it's an old road uh, that starts everything and there's a, there's a gate across the road. So I got to the gate and I'm standing there, you know, I can go to the left and walk about 80 feet or so around the gate and through the trees and up to the road. I can go to my right 30 feet through some water, some slough grass and come around back to my truck, or I can just go underneath the gate and walk 10 feet to my truck. Um, I decided to make the stupid decision of going underneath the gate. As soon as I went underneath it, I started to pass out and lose consciousness. Um, there was a, road sign there i just grabbed the sign that had the holes through it like the channel with the holes through i shoved my fingers in the holes and i was holding on for dear life and i was wobbly and almost passing out and it took you know probably eight nine minutes ten minutes for me to recover i'm oh. able to stand up and i then i got to my truck <laughs> The first thing I did when I got to my truck is I took the mirror and I pushed the, the driver's mirror forward so I couldn't see myself. Open up the door, hopped in the front seat, removed the rear view mirror. I really didn't want to look, see what it looked like. I started up the truck and I remember looking out the windshield going, wait, wait a second, I can't see the end of the hood. I uh, rolled down the window and I'm looking outside the truck and I couldn't see the ground. I couldn't tell where the ground was and I was like, well, what the heck, what do you do? All I could, drive, yeah. yeah, all I could see was just dark green on the sides and then the light spot down the middle. And I figured the light spot was the middle of the road. I'm just going to aim for that and go. I mean, hopefully I'll run into somebody along the way. Uh, well, 22 kilometers later, the on the road, I got to a little ranch. But in between there, there's a uh, you're driving up on the side of a mountain's got to drop off on one side. There's a little bit of a guardrail. <laughs> it's like a, a gravel road from hell. <laughs> My wife, uh, she, she hates those things. Like when I'm driving, she's freaking out, you know, like 
she just is she doesn't like going over bridges and stuff and here you are doing it with essentially blind (laughs) (laughs) and the the whole time i could feel it was a very rough ride i thought i was driving in a ditch and my truck was either riding against the guardrail it wasn't really guardrails like a metal post with cable stretching in between every so far Mm -hmm. and and i thought my truck was really total when i got to this place because it just felt well i felt like i was driving in the ditch Mm -hmm. through the bush uh so i got to this little called panther resort it's a place where you can go and ride horses and they have uh you can camp out there they got little cabins you can stay in i pull into there and drive right up to the to the lodge and uh, i was there the weekend before so i knew the kind of layout um the main uh lodge area is shaped like a octagon and it's a wood cabin they got the trusses coming down or the log beams coming down stick out onto this balcony so um you hit your head on him being a tall person so i'm walking on the deck around the half of the octagon and there's windows all around the whole thing and uh this is getting close to the door i noticed in one of the windows i can see like a little shadow of a kid and you just see this kind of move away from the window quickly and i was opening up the door and i just hear this young kid's voice like grandma grandma someone's trying to play a prank on us and i i literally looked like a zombie I'm sure. Yeah. Jeez. Uh, I'm wearing I'm wearing shorts. I got a t-shirt on. I got this thing over my head. I'm covered in blood, dirt, you know, paper towel. Everything's just hanging down. And when I got in there, there's two ladies there and they were pretty well in shock. And you know, I handed them my wallet right away and the keys to my truck. And here's who I am. And gave my cell phone, like call my wife, let her know I'm fine. Um, you know, call me an ambulance. I was attacked by a bear and and then they're like, is there anything we can do for you? And I was like, yeah, I like a glass of medium temperature water, a straw, and no ice. <laughs> <laughs> so they give me this glass of water. I'm trying to sip it back. And my mouth, like I don't have any lips or anything. And I'm trying to squish them between teeth and just suck back some water. And I'm bleeding all over the place. And I'm on the floor trying to clean it up. Although these are calling, you know, 911 and. And the one girl is just yelling at me, like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I'm making a mess. And she's like, get out of here. Like, quit it. <laughs> they, they threw me in my truck and drove me out back. And uh, we were going to wait for stars or an ambulance to come out. And so ladies were running back and forth. And you can hear them running across the gravel. And and uh, I was worried about one of them getting hurt. And then they wouldn't be able to help me out. They kept yelling at me, you know, like, hey, just like calm down. I'm just missing my face. And like, I just need you to relax. <laughs> awesome. My face is all actually, I have pieces of it in this shirt I've tied up if you want to look at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, we end up being there for quite a while. And one of them came out and said, hey, the helicopter's coming. It'll be here in like a half hour, you know, 45 minutes. I was like, okay, sweet. I mean, I'm sitting in the passenger seat of my truck, and there's this young lady in front of me at the door. Door is open. She's leaning against the door. She won't give me any kind of eye contact. She's just sitting there, <laughs> just trying to have a conversation with her. Because we're sitting there, like you know, like how, you know, uh, I'm trying to talk. It's like I'm kind of kind of mumbling. You know, I'm like, so what's your name? You know, what do you do? Uh, just like twenty questions, right? And mm-hmm. and uh, when we heard about the helicopters coming, I was like, sweet, I'm going fishing. There's a there's a stream that's not too or a creek that's you know like twenty feet away. I'm going to grab my flyer on. I'm going to go try to catch some bull trout while I'm waiting for the helicopter. You know, I, mean, I was, I was relaxed. I was at this point in time, I knew I was going to make it. Uh, so I, oh, so I got out of the truck and was standing there trying to open up and one of the other ladies come out. She's like, what, are, what the hell are you doing? I'm like, I'm going fishing. She's like, no, you're not. You're getting back in your damn truck. I said, well, if the helicopter is going to be here in, you know, 20 minutes, I'm going to go fishing. <laughs> So anyways, I wasn't allowed to go fishing. They threw me back in the truck and told me to stay there. And uh, the helicopter landed. It was uh, ended up being uh, the owner of the lodge. Uh, one of the ladies that was there was her dad owned the place. And she was she was there helping. And her dad flew in his private helicopter to come pick me up to take me to to fly me into town. Uh, we get there and real nice fancy helicopter. Uh, I get in. They had wrapped me up. They wrapped a tarp around the inside of it, loaded me in and took off and um, I haven't been in a helicopter in the mountains up in there, so I was pretty excited, and you know, I kind of want to look out the window. Well, we, <laughs> wait, wait we hold get... on. If I look out the window, my my eyeball might fall out. <laughs> <laughs> if I look down, now if I'm looking up, it's all right. <laughs> yeah. So 
<laughs> you look in the helicopter and, and uh, everybody's got the little earmuffs on and and you know i get nothing no ears like oh, everything's all messed up and so i so the helicopter starts up and you can't hear nothing you can just lots of noise uh so we left off and i'm trying to look out the window i'm leaning over trying to look out the window because i want to see the scenery and i can't see at all i'm trying to make things out as i'm looking out i feel this really sharp poke in my right and my left side and i'm like so i turn and look and there's a lady there. her name was amanda sitting in the helicopter she looked at me and as i turned my head she pulled this tarp up I'm like, what the heck? So I'll try and lean out, look out the window again. As I'm looking out the window, I get another sharp poke and I turn it over and she pulls the tarp up. I'm like, what the hell? Are we playing peekaboo here? Like, <laughs> mm. uh, when I was leaning over, look out the window, she thought I was passing out. So she was poking me, pinching me, trying to wake me up. And when I would go turn to look at her, blood would squirt out of my head and squirt all the place. So she'd pull the tarp up to protect <laughs> oh herself. My God. So here I'm thinking she's trying to play peekaboo. Huh. <laughs> so we we flew to a small town which is about a 15 20 minute flight called the town's called sundry and they're very small town the emergency room is like the waiting room everything all in one uh we we land there in the helicopter and there's a whole line of people outside the helicopter just waiting for us and um everybody seemed like they're kind of like lollygagging and you can tell no one was really moving fast the mood was calm they opened up the door my side of the helicopter and I remember I turned to look and said, hi. And that's when panic kind of set in. Everybody started freaking out. Uh, and one of the doctors tried cutting through the back of the helicopter. He was trying to cut around the helicopter while it had an open tail rotor. And so the Amanda was in the back seat. She hops out. She ends up tackling the doctor and just like, hey, like, watch out. You know, like the blades are going. She's arguing with him, trying to hold him back, trying to stop everybody from going behind the helicopter. They're trying to pull me out. She's yelling at the nurses and doctors trying to pull me out. She's like, just leave him alone. He got in. He can get out. I'm trying to get my leg out, swing it over the seat, because at this point in time, it was now stiff and couldn't bend it. Uh, I just felt two little hands, two little arms and hands come around me, grab me by the chest from behind. And this little nurse, you know, maybe five foot nothing, pulls me out, throws me on a gurney and push me into the into the hospital. Um, and then from there, it was there. Uh, probably half hour or so they just basically threw me in an ambulance and uh took me on another hour and a half down to where i live in calgary to a hospital called the foothills hospital hmm. but yeah wow and so the extent of your injuries obviously very traumatic um how many how many surgeries did you have the bits and pieces of your face were those were those uh, usable or just trash or you know talk a little bit about the, that and and the recovery process so the uh first uh when i first got to the hospital the first surgery was 13 hours where they kind of put everything back together they stitched my hands up uh attached all my ligaments and did a majority of my face uh, the following day i woke up in icu and then the third day they took me back in for another 12 13 hour surgery to help finish everything up in my ears, trying to make a face all level. Um, so I went through three, uh, two surgeries right away. I was in hospital for a total of five weeks. And throughout the hospital stay, there was three, four, four, four big surgeries. Uh -huh. We're longer than, you know, two around 12, 13 hours, a couple, six hours. Uh, and then about a month after being in the hospital on the right side of my head here, it was still all bone or skull and plate exposed. Um, they brought me into surgery to close it up. I uh, take a chunk of my chunk of my head and tried moving it over top to cover up the bone and plates because skin won't grow on top of bone. Yeah. Uh, well, that didn't work. So they ended up moving it back and then they just took a, they end up falling down my skull because there's blood flow inside your, inside your bones a little bit. And I covered it with a skin graft and figured, heck, we'll leave it for now. And we'll put some tissue expanders in and expand your head and take an artery out of your neck and move it to your head. And um, but actually the skin actually took over top of the bone and uh oh. it you know, uh, well, and now I get skin there, no hair, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. But so were they able to the the pieces that you picked up, were they able to use those? Yeah, they were able to use those. Uh, you know, I still got my my nose, my mustache goatee. Uh, they were able to stitch all of it back together. Uh, there was lots of staples, lots of stitches. Mm -hmm. It took them over a week to pull out staples and stitches every day, eight hours a day. They'd come in and just 
do sections of my face. I mean, I had hundreds and hundreds of staples in my face alone. Yeah. Oh my God. Doesn't look that bad. All things considered you, they, they might say you have a face for a, a podcast. For yeah. They, well, I've heard that one for me for 15 years. So yeah. <laughs> uh, or, or an author. So, I mean, you've come on and told the story, but you also have a very detailed book out called mauled, uh, which came out this fall. Uh, so I'm sure that it's basically this story and then times 10 on, uh, other, other little nuggets. And I'm sure it goes into more detail on the recovery and all of that stuff. And, um, I mean, that's how I found, I, I, I actually saw someone recommended the book to me and I was like, well, this is fascinating. And, uh, Jeremy seems willing to talk about it. I, I, I did see in our conversation, you still got emotional thinking that this was going to be the end and, and, you know, reflecting on your wife and your eight month old daughter, you've done a lot of these conversations though. And it's, and you, st- I guess you still get emotional every time, huh? I, I still do. Sometimes it hits me pretty hard. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's hard to talk about some of the, you know, giving up and that it, it's hard to talk about it. Uh-huh. It's getting easier. Yeah. Uh, it's still pretty tough. It, it's still pretty close. So this happened in 2017. When did you first start doing interviews and become comfortable telling your story? Well, uh, actually up until let's say August of last year, I didn't really let anybody know that I was writing a book. We did it for about two years, took about two years, COVID came in between. So I ended up extending the writing the book process. Uh, but I didn't start doing interviews till I guess early September of last year, just before the book came out. Um, it was hard, uh, because there's some things in the book that I never told anybody or never mentioned about. And I was really afraid of letting people know, um, you know, the part of me giving up and wanting to commit suicide. And then the struggles with PTSD after uh, that, that played a huge role in things. And, and it's hard to, it's hard to tell people that you, you know, you needed help and you got psychiatric help. Um, so I started doing the interviews in mid September and then now it's just continuing on and on each interview I do, it gets easier and easier to talk about it. And, uh, uh-huh. Yeah, I imagine there would be some serious PTSD there. Um, I don't, you don't seem like the kind of guy that quit hunting. I mean, I assume you're, you're back to your old, uh, your old ways and spending time in the woods again. Oh, yes. Uh, it was 48 hours of being out of the hospital. I went back to the, the lodge uh, to meet the ladies that helped me out. And then we went back to the gate. And on that day, uh, we walked around a little bit and I ended up shooting two spruce grouse and, getting back out there and a couple days later i uh, harvested a white-tailed doe i mean i i just i couldn't stop i mean crutches <laughs> braces whatever i was out there I, I mean i got more rules now with the wife i mean i got two young kids and i want to be around for for them for a little mm-hmm. while longer so now i you know use a garment in reach got that with me with a heartbeat monitor so my wife can track me uh, i'm i can't hunt by myself unless i'm on the prairies or an area where there's no chance of seeing a bear or being bears there yeah um yeah you can always go with somebody and yeah i uh the first the first elk tag i ever drew i had a buddy that was supposed to go with me it was in new mexico and uh he bailed last minute he had some a sickness in his family he couldn't go i went solo my wife was not a big fan of that and there's no grizzlies there, but you know, you're packed in seven, eight miles by yourself. I did have a satellite phone. I checked in with her every night, told her I was alive. Uh, but for me personally, by the seventh day, I was like, I was lonely. Like I, I was like looking for someone to talk to and there wasn't anybody. I saw one other human being on horseback that entire time said hi to him. They were, you know, they were going hunting too. That was it. And uh, by the seventh day, I was like, I don't see how hermits do this. Just a total recluse and and have no interaction with anyone i you know some people are built different i i i certainly enjoy the camaraderie of of hunting even if you split up for the day which i enjoy you know my buddy and i went to wyoming for nine days this past year and we spent half the time hunting together and half the time hunting by ourselves but at the end of the day i you know i like uh the camaraderie around the campfire and talking about how the day went certainly for me more than than being solo uh for an extended period of time anyway 
I, I like that too. Uh, but when we go sheep hunting, it's hard to find somebody that would stick with you for, you know, a week or mm. so. I had one good friend that we used to go out all the time and we'd go, you know, 15, 20 days back in or longer. And, and, uh, at some point in time, he'd just say, oh, enough's enough. I had, had enough of the snow walking up and down <laughs> these hills, freezing my butt off. <laughs> yeah. That stuff is taxing and it drains you mentally, but, uh, I think I could deal with that a lot more than just the, uh, solitude. Which, don't get me wrong, I like to. I like hunting by myself. I like sitting in a tree stand sometimes all day by myself and, and just thinking about things and, and life. And but day five six, now nah, I'm ready to to visit with somebody. Um, what about so so the book's available wherever it's out now. It came out what uh what did it come out September October Sep- September twenty seventh uh twenty twenty two. Yep. Yeah. You can. Uh, pick up the book uh, at a variety of locations, you know, at uh, Indigo Chapters, um, your local bookstore, um, Amazon, you can get it from there, or you can get a, a signed copy directly from me on uh, my webpage, uh, grizzlydude.ca, mm-hmm. and I can ship anywhere in the United States and Canada, and um, every book that you buy off that website, uh, it's signed, and you get a nice fancy bookmark with it uh, of one of my funky sayings and like a piece of your ear or something in there yeah. <laughs> uh so have you seen a bear since this happened yes uh the was three weeks out of being out of the hospital i went back over with a friend in the area to go look for some sheep we saw we saw five grizzly bears that day just driving around and we got out walking around ran into a cell with two cubs you know fair ways away they were barking at us um i was okay with it I can understand the situation. Uh, he wasn't, he was pretty nervous. So we that kind of ended our hunt pretty or ended our day pretty quick. Uh-huh. Uh, the, the following year we hiked back in to uh, the, to the same area, but on the backside of the mountain where I harvested a non trophy sheep, which is a, a female mm-hmm. <laughs> on the way out, we ran into a young boar who was on a elk he had killed and he was sitting there barking at us two, 300 yards away, come bluff charging in and, um, yeah, that was a little nerve wracking. Uh, he never got any close to it, anywhere more than say 200 yards from us. We fired off our bear bangers and had our bear spray out and we were watching him and, um, some other air- people in the area were on horseback and they saw us coming down the mountainside. They rode over their horses to kind of help out. They knew of, uh, the bear was in there on a kill and mm-hmm. they'd come and let us know. And so, uh, yeah, but having any close encounters were, you know, closer than a hundred feet, I guess. Those are probably close enough, considering all things. Uh, do, you don't you don't harbor any ill will towards that bear. Uh, no, I, I don't. Uh, no, nothing towards the bear at all. Uh, she, you know, we it just was a bad. I was in a, I guess, the wrong place at the wrong time. So was she. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, you know, they got between, or you know, I got between them, and they got between me and the cub. Uh, she was just doing what a mama bear does is protecting her young. And there's no, there's no need to do anything to her. I hope, I hope she's actually out there doing fine. Um, she's protecting her cub. I can't blame her for that. I was an idiot. Didn't have my bear spray ready. So yeah, it is what it is. Yeah. Well, you always wonder what this fast is these, you, you wouldn't think bears can move as fast as they can, but they're damn quick. And oh, yes. even if you would have had it, would it, would it have mattered? I don't know. Do you think it would have? I think it would have. I think, uh, well, the year before this, I got charged by a bear in the same area and I sprayed that one and that one stopped on the dime. Huh. Uh, so that worked very effective yeah. bear spray. If I had it, if I actually had it on me, I could have felt that when, when she first charged in, I could have just fell down and sprayed her as it was falling down and, and that, that would have stopped her. I'm pretty confident in that. Okay. Well, that's a good piece of insight there. Um, and, and some people are like, well, do you want to take a handgun or bear spray? I, I, I don't know. I'd rather I'd rather take a bear spray than a handgun. I mean, you can have a handgun, great, but uh, could you hit a bear running at you from fifty feet? I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. I've seen grizzly bears go hundred yards in like five leaps in a couple seconds, and yeah. then if you could get your gun out and shoot them, could you kill them in one hit? And and, and if they're chewing on you, what's the chance you can be able to pull your gun out and and shoot them and kill them? I mean the the whole attack, all three rounds together is probably between 10 to 12 minutes total from start to finish. But the only time we're actually physically fought the bear was maybe 90 to 120 seconds of hand-to-hand combat when she's chewing on my face. So she did a lot of damage in a very short amount of time. Yeah. 
Ugh. And how much do you think this bear weighed? Uh, the the investigation team figured she was the average size, 300, 350 pounds. So not a, a an average size for a grizzly bear, not a large one by any means. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Well, man, I, I certainly appreciate you being willing to share your story. Um, very courageous from the, the, the lowest of low points where you think this is the end. I might just end it myself. I don't think I'm going to live to, you know, one, one rock at a time. And, uh, yeah, dude, I, I can't even imagine. Uh, so we certainly appreciate you being transparent and, and opening. Yeah, it's not easy, you know, making yourself vulnerable. Uh, but you've done that here and you've certainly done it with the book as well. So we appreciate that, man. No problem. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So, uh, and then uh, Instagram is the grizzly dude one. And in some weird twist of fate, uh, I mean, this bear has, I don't know what you do for a living, but it certainly, you know, helped support your family if this book is doing well. Yeah, the, well, the book just came out, so um, uh, you know it's doing fairly well. I think we're around seven thousand copies sold to date. Uh -huh. uh, the book has opened up some new opportunities for me. Uh, one of the things is getting into motivational speaking. So I've had lots of requests to go do dinner events, uh, talk to talk at schools. Um, so I got into starting getting into that more and more motivational speaking, sharing my story, using that and the lessons I learned that day, you know, like that, that family comes first and they're one of the most powerful forces on the planet. Um, yeah. you know, be prepared for the unexpected and asking for a psychiatric, psychiatric help is not a weakness, but it's a, it's a strength. Mm -hmm. And and when you set, you know, many goals, you can achieve incredible things. So, so this has led this book coming out now has led to into, the motivational speaking side i mean I'm, I'm just starting out it's uh it's going fairly well it's still some things are still pretty emotional but i'm getting through it um yeah. and i started uh there's also grizzly dude merch um reason for the name grizzly dude is the first person to see me was a nine-year-old boy and at that ranch uh they nicknamed me the grizzly dude uh, you know mm -hmm. media of course swarmed it was asking for things and they just called me the grizzly dude that's cool <laughs> So when yeah. the book came book came out was coming out, I created a grizzly dude uh, logo and uh, for my team's background and a slogan. You could bear it because I like puns and I joke about the grizzly bear attack lots now. Uh, <laughs> you can bear it. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I love it, man. So uh, so you have a website then too? Yeah, it's uh, the grizzly dude. Okay. Ca or grizzly dude. Ca. Okay, I think you yeah you mentioned that. So that's where I can find a, t a t shirt. Correct. T-shirt, cool. hats, bookmarks. Well, I even got water bottles, you know, now like swell water bottles and uh, nice Yeti coffee mugs. So what, what the goal was with the Grizzly Dude and the merch was to help raise money for uh, PTSD research for PTSD to help, you know, people that suffer with PTSD from being, you know, outdoor passions. Um, well, my goal is to try to raise $5 million. I want to get an endowed, uh, I want to get an endowed position chair position at a university where that money is used to uh, fund research into PTSD recovery and treatments uh -huh. and so the yeah the the five million dollars gets endowed and it uh, the money generated off that five million runs the department and so whoever gets hired to run that that chair position can go and get research for more money more grants and then that money lasts forever I want to help a lot of people. I mean, that, that's so uh, some, some of the proceeds from the shirts and water bottles goes to is going towards that 5 million. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's my ultimate goal. I want to help more people. Well, giving back, man, that's awesome. We certainly appreciate it, uh, Jeremy. Y'all check it out. The book mauled and uh, the grizzly dude dot C A C A is the website. So, well, man, thanks again, Jeremy. It's been a, a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. All right. Take care, brother. You too.